Uh, just to give you a quick recap, the last few weeks I've been preaching, uh, we're in a, a, a short sermon series, so I'm just going to do four weeks because I, I stole a sermon already out of the series that I used during Women of Faith. But we're doing a short sermon series out of the book of Joshua, and I love the book of Joshua. If you've not read Joshua there in the Old Testament, uh, I would invite you Get in there, dig into it, because there's some just amazing stories, as you're going to hear again today, uh, out of this book of the Bible. And I just want to recap it real quick. Joshua is this transition point where the Israelites are transitioning from the leadership of Moses, who, of course, led them through the desert for 40 years out of the Egyptian uh, slavery into the desert and all of that. Well, after Moses has led for 40 years, and now it's time for them to finally get to taking the land of Canaan that they had failed 40 years before, uh, it's a transition point because Moses dies and Joshua is raised up as the new leader. Now, Moses, of course, had been grooming Joshua along the way. This is not a surprise. And one of the things that we see from both Moses as well as God that's repeated to Joshua many, many times is be strong and courageous, right? We talked about that the very first week. And, and repeat He's told, be strong and courageous as they are about to enter into the promised land. Then we came to last week where now they were on the edge of the Jordan River. But the dilemma with the Jordan River was at the time of harvest, at this time of year in that part of uh, where Israel is and in that part of the region where the Jordan River runs, at that stage in time, it was flood season. And the Jordan River was enormously out of its banks, hugely, hugely flooding, impossible just to go walking across. I mean, you've probably, many of you, seen people going and getting baptized in the Jordan River, and it doesn't look like this, you know, grand river. Well, like I said, the two things that were going against it was, first, it was flood season, but second, there used to be much, 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 much more water in the Jordan River than there is today because of all the population that lives there now, there's a lot of water that gets taken out of that river. So back in the day, much bigger river, and it was a problem. Well, Joshua, in being faithful, uh, is told, no, we're going to cross this thing. We're going to go to the other side. And that kind of brings us to where we are today. They had to step out in faith, and and we're going to jump off from there. So if you have a Bible, there are some in the pews. You're welcome to open it up. Uh, We're going to be in Joshua 4, uh, basically for the entirety of the sermon. There are a few in the pews. If you don't own a Bible, the Welcome Center has some blue Bibles that are for your taking. Take one home. If you know somebody who needs a Bible, take it. If you don't have a Bible but you have a smartphone, version is a tremendous Bible app. Works on Android or iPhones. Um, works on your computer even. Open up version. Feel free to find yourself a Bible. I'm going to read to you at least uh, the first portion here of Joshua 4. I'm going to read 1 through uh, 9, I guess, is what I will read. There it says, and this is the word of God. It says that the whole nation had finished, or when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men that he he appointed from the Israel, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of your Lord, your God, in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of Israel to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at a spot where the priests who had carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are still standing to this day. Thus says the word of the Lord. This is undoubtedly one of the most climatic events in all of biblical history. This is a pinnacle moment. The Israelites had been waiting for 40 long years. But now, finally, the time had come. This is a a, a poignant moment in their history as they stride across this dry riverbed of the Jordan. 
this riverbed that had been opened wide for them by the miraculous power of God. Behind them, they left behind them wearying decades of meandering through a barren wilderness. They left behind them all of the tragic memories, all of the the countless funerals those 40 years, all of those people who had in fear not crossed the Jordan, all of those people who had not trusted God's promises, they were leaving all of that behind. They were leaving behind them the slavery that they'd experienced in Egypt and the just bare survival that they had there and then of the nomadic life that they had just undergone. The Israelites are leaving their past failures and their fears behind them and moving forward in faith. A new and welcome chapter opens up before them. In front of them lay a new land, a land richer than their dreams, more, more fruitful than their hopes, more beautiful than anything they could have ever imagined. Now it is theirs by God's steadfast promise. You think about it, it must have felt almost surreal if you were an Israelite that day to finally be standing in Canaan. Kind of if you've ever purchased your first home, right? You ever purchased your first home, that very first time you put that key in the lock and that lock unlocks and you open the door and you step inside. This is mine. I own this. Kind of like that, but a whole lot more. To be the fulfillment of this ancient promise, this promise that had been given to Father Abraham must have just been amazing and overwhelming to be there and be part of it. They had waited for 40 long years for this moment. And not only that, their joy had to be magnified by recent events, right? I mean, when they got to the River Jordan, as I mentioned and talked about last week quite a bit, they find this river at flood stage. And and as it floods out of its banks, if you know these desert areas, the only place much grows is along a river bank because it's pretty dry. So along the river bank, which is now underwater, all these bushes and roots and trees and rocks and gnarls and things that are, if you walk out in there, they're going to catch you and they're going to pull you under and bad things are going to happen if you try to cross this river. And so they showed up and they stepped out in faith and God intervened. And the river that was impassable became passable. God did the impossible by making it passable. God intervened, performed a miracle that paralleled the miracle that they had seen just a little over 40 years prior, right? As they were exiting Egypt. God rolled back the river Jordan's waters just as he had done with the Red Sea. You see, God meant what he had said through Moses years before. Here was his signature once again. In the very same way, he is assuring his people that he was good to his word, that he was going to fulfill his promises. Now, as this was going on, as they go down from the banks of the Jordan, as the water backs itself up, as the riverbed goes dry, as they cross the river on the dry riverbed, I imagine there were songs of praise and and just shouts of joy and worship going forth, just exalting of God that he had shown up once again in such an amazing and abundant way. But there was also one other important act that calls for our attention in this story this morning. There it said, as I read, after Israel crossed, God gave Joshua some very specific instructions I read those in Joshua 4, 1 through 3. It says, after the entire nation had crossed the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, go get a stone each. Right out of the middle of the Jordan where the Ark of the Covenant was, right there, down by the priest's feet, go get one of those rocks. Bring it back over here with you and set them down here where we're setting up camp for the night. So Joshua does exactly as he was told to do. He sends these 12 men out. They go out and they get the point. They're out there. And if you can imagine this, I mean, they're, they're out in the riverbed. 
that had just briefly before this been many, many feet underwater, probably layers of silt and muck and dirt, sediment from further upstream. And here they are able to reach these stones that have been buried. Stones that would have been unreachable. Stones that were covered by a challenge to the faithfulness of God's people. But now they are divinely accessible. See, these 12 men, they pick up these heavy stones, put them on their shoulders from the Jordan's floor, and they take them out of the riverbed, and they pile them up on the promised land just as God had commanded. And they were stacked there as a sign, as an unmistakable marker that at this very place, God showed up and God demonstrated his power to overcome any obstacle as he wills. And you see, because stones don't normally stack themselves, right? There would come a day when somebody would be walking by and they'd go, what's the deal with these stones that are piled up on one another here? Scripture says someday Israel's children would ask for an explanation of this phenomenon. Why are these stones stacked here? And here's the answer that God gives and wants the next generation to know. Verse 7, he says, tell them the story of how the water in the river Jordan was cut off. It was stopped so that my people might cross. God was here with us. Then verses 23 and 24, which I didn't read, but if you read ahead, it says, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. This is so that the people of earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty, and so that you may always fear the Lord your God. This is what happens when impossible meets the promises of God. This is the outcome when the implausible comes up against the the glorious riches of God in Christ Jesus. As we've been going through this, if you've been reading along, if you've been jumping ahead and reading some of Joshua, you might have noticed that throughout this book, and and not even just throughout this book, but throughout the Bible, in fact, it frequently says, the Lord said. And then following that, when the people were obedient, amazing things happened, right? We see it in Joshua 4.1. Can it get any simpler than that? The Lord said the people were obedient and amazing things happened. Let me tell you something. If God is telling you to do something, do it, right? This isn't rocket science. Start doing what he is telling you to do. Or the opposite, stop doing if he's telling you to stop. Do it and be obedient and see him work in ways in your life that you have never seen before. There is something in each and every one of our lives, an area of all of our lives, that even today God is waiting for you to be obedient in. God wants to do great things in and through you, but he's waiting for you to be obedient waiting for you to signal that you are actually ready. Now, I've got a couple of guys who are going to help me here. We have some stones. We're going to hand out some stones. Everybody's going to get a stone. As the stones go, guys, if you'll come grab these baskets and come on over, Noah, come on over. Um, I've got three baskets. We're going to pass the baskets around, grab one of these stones, and maybe about every other person grab a permanent marker to go with it. We're going to pass these out. If you want to grab that one, I'll get this one so we get everybody. Everybody's getting a stone today. No, they're not to stone me with. (laughs) Even if I get long. While those are being handed out, I'm going to keep talking and tell you about a story here about an experience of my own. Uh, If you need some more, there are some more up here. Sorry. I didn't mean to drop it off and leave you hanging. Sorry, Tanya. Thank you. It's always good to have help. Uh, Mike is going to have some slides here as I speak. I want to tell you about a story where I experienced an awful lot of rock in my past. Um, this was back in the summer of 
1994. Uh, my first year of college had been completed. If you don't know my background, uh, for three years I was a professional backpacking guide in the mountains of New Mexico. And following my work as a backpacking guide, um, on my way home, I lived in South Dakota, myself and a couple of other friends, a guy by the name of Don Cotting and another friend of mine, uh, his name was Andy, the three of us hatched this idea and said we were going to go climb Long's Peak. Anybody know where Long's Peak is? Long's Peak, if you've ever been to Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado, by Estes Park, Long's Peak is that big diamond one that looks really cool that you can see from everywhere. It's a giant mountain. Over 14,255 feet, in fact, of giant mountain. And so go ahead with those first slides there. This is the picture of it as you see it from the east and you're kind of approaching it. It has this huge diamond. At the bottom of it, it's the most beautiful lake you'll ever see because it's all snow melt. Just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous place to be. You can go ahead to the next one, Micah. Um, and so the three of us hatched this idea. We're going to go climb Long's Peak. And... Uh, this is a, a, a significant undertaking. Some days Long's Peak is challenging. Some days Long's Peak can be deadly. Um, we were some of the very first people to be climbing it this particular year. It's so high up in the mountains that it has glaciers on it. And there's times of the year that without being a professional mountain climber, you're not allowed to get a license to go up and climb it. There's other times of the year where anybody can go climb it whenever they want. But we happen to be very early in the climbing season after a particularly heavy snow season the winter before. And so some of the path was still under snow. Um, some of the path markers were not going to be findable. And we were going to, at some point in time, have to traverse vertically up part of the glacier. So we had to go rent ice axes in case we were to fall so we could stop ourselves and not die and the fall off the end of the bottom of the glacier. So that's kind of what we chose to do. That's the kind of stuff I used to like doing. Go ahead. Uh, we can leave, leave it. Yeah, there we go. So the first one was a little cairn. This is a bigger cairn. As you walk through, of course, the very beginning, you're down in the forest, in the woods, and the trails are obvious, and there's trail signs to mark your way. But once you get above the elevation where trees grow, they have to start building things so you can figure out where you're going. And they start off with small little cairns, which are little rock piles that are clearly man-made, because again, rocks don't pile themselves up. And eventually, they turn into larger and larger and larger piles of rock as you go, because this one, as you can see, is in a fairly, fairly rocky area. And we'll get to some other pictures in just a moment. If, Michael, you want to go to the next one, you'll see why. Eventually, if you don't start making really large stacks of rock, you can't tell the piles of rock from all the other rock and you don't know how and where to go. This is called the boulder field, and as you can see, over time, people have cleared spaces in it, and you can, through the park service, get permission, um, a number of people, there's a very limited number of these spots, but you can get permission to sleep there overnight because this is such an arduous task. Most people don't like to do it in a single day. They like to take two days or three days to do it, and so they'll camp, they'll summit, and then come back down to their camp. We didn't have that luxury. We had to go all the way from the ranger station down at about, I don't know, 8,000 feet, all the way up to the 14,255 feet, and all the way back down in one day. And it's about round trip, I don't know, 18 miles, something in that area. It's a long ways from the ranger station. So even just walking that far in a single day, that's more than I normally would like to do. But again, I used to be a backpacking guide, so it wasn't so bad. So go ahead to the next one, Micah. So this segment, after you've come out of the trees and you've walked for quite a while, uh, basically on a high mountain moraine where there's no trees, you enter this boulder field. And this is what it looks like. And there's paths, and you can kind of see the point there, um, where the pink at the bottom is the beginning of the path. The point at the top is called the keyhole, and your job is to make your way through these Volkswagen-sized rocks from here to there. Now, this is the last place you can reliably get water. If you get down on your hands and knees underneath these rocks, the whole time you can hear the river. It's, there's a river literally running under these rocks, and you can just move rocks apart and get glacial snowmelt to drink. The coldest and most delicious water you'll ever drink. Um, it's fantastic. And so you fill up your jugs before you go up through the keyhole. Go ahead to the next one, Micah. And so when you get to the keyhole, we're getting closer there. The keyhole, as it says, is at about 13,000 feet. Um, this is the point where most people will day hike to. Most people hike here 
and they stop. If you look really closely, um, you can see there's kind of a, there's actually a building built there. It would be on the left-hand side, just off of the keyhole across from that pink line. You can kind of see two rectangular windows. Over time, they built up a protection shelter because occasionally storms roll in quickly and you need to find shelter. If you're hiking up there, uh, that can be a lifesaver. So go ahead to the next one, Micah. So as you cross, you kind of cross the ridge of the mountain. This is the backside looking back towards the keyhole. Where that pink line is, that's the trail. That's where you have to walk. And over to that left-hand side, it, it, it's, it's, it's a slant for a while, and then it's a drop-off. So if you slide off, you're gone. Um, not, not somewhere to play around. You can go single file, and, and if you meet somebody coming down as you're going up, uh, you have to find spots where you can pass one another. It, it's a little, little sketchy, a little bit scary. Go ahead to the next one, Micah. Um, and that leads to this. This is an area called the Narrows. And there was a few places in the Narrows that I was probably as afraid for my life as I have ever been. Um, where if you fall, it's, I don't know, 1,000, 1,200 feet down to the valley floor below, and you're not going to survive. And we're the fools who choose to do this. You can see first, there's a little red with yellow circle. Uh, these are dots that are painted as bullseyes on the rock. Go ahead and go to the next one, Micah. And these are what guide you once you get to these elevations because you can no longer stack rock. There's no room to stack rock. There's not even enough rock to stack. And so they just paint on these giant walls of rock bullseyes. And when you stand with your back against one bullseye, in theory, you're supposed to be able to see the next bullseye depending on which direction you're going. So they they line up, they're pointed so that you can find your way. But as I said, we were there pretty early in the season. So in a number of places, we were just guessing because the bullseyes were still under snow. But this is the methodology. Go ahead to the next one, Micah. And so you can kind of see the trail as we're working our way across. And, And you can't quite see it here, but there's kind of a gash there. That's called the trough. And that's where we're going to next if you want to click it, Micah. (coughs) This is the trough. And this view of it is pretty deceiving because it's at, I don't know, about 70 degrees. How some of these rocks even stay without all falling down, I don't even know. Um, It's as steep of a place as you could climb. It's frightening um, and fun and exciting and all of that. Um, But in the trough, um, this is actually the upper part of the trough, right below where this picture is taken is where the glacier is. So you had to hike up a glacier Now you're walking up this very last little part. And then that very last, probably 150 or 200 feet, is simply a slab of rock. And you just have to grab into the cracks and climb your way up. And once you you get through the trough, um, you'll make it to the top. I think the next picture is actually of the glacier, if somebody wants to see what that glacier looks like. This is what the glacier looks like. And this is later in the season. You can see lots of footprints. Um, Myself and Andy... We were wise, and we tried to stay over to the side, closer to the rocks. And so we didn't have too many problems. Don, who was quite adventurous, and, and Don was actually, after he, we climbed this mountain, was going to Mount Whitney to climb that a week later. So he was a more experienced guy. He went out in the middle of this glacier. Well, Don, turns out, slips and falls and slides about 250, 300 yards before he was able to get himself stopped. And we were freaked out. Um, Thankfully, he was able to get his ice axe down, get it to dig into the snow, and arrest his slide. But again, very frightening. Next one there, Micah. Finally, as you do this, you make it to the top. And by this point, if you've not been there before, 14,000 feet, you are starved for oxygen. I mean, even if you've driven up like Pikes Peak, you get out and you walk around your car and you're like, I need a break, (laughs) Right? I mean, it, it's, there's not much oxygen at that level. And so you make it to the top, you're exhausted, you're hungry, you're hot, you're tired, but it's the most amazing feeling to be on top of the world. You can see, like, most of the state of Colorado from this point. Just, just absolutely amazing. And then one more there. Um, the last one, Micah, is, is the benchmark. This is the benchmark, and I don't know if you can really read it, but it says it's 14,255 feet. And the benchmark is put there by the U.S. Geological Surveys, uh, Surveyors, that marks and indicates the height of that mountain. And why am I telling you the story? Well, I needed something to do while we pass the rocks out first. But also, it's an important story in that the rocks were crucial to our success or failure. The rocks made all of the difference that day. See, those rocks that 
we were looking at, and you saw the bullseyes, and you can turn those off now, Micah. The rocks that we were looking at, the rocks that we were using, they marked the right path for us along the way. And then in obedience, following those rocks and doing what my more experienced partners did with me, by following them, good things happened by staying true to what the rocks were indicating. And that's true for me in this trip, but that's also true for us spiritually. So hopefully by now you have a stone in your hand. I forgot to get one, but I'll pretend I have a stone. So hopefully you have a stone in your hand. What, what does the stone mean then, Pastor, right? The stone in your hand is to tell you that it's all about God. Joshua had 12 leaders, one from each tribe, go and grab a stone from the dry riverbed. And then on the other side, they were to be obedient to the Lord. Joshua goes and makes his own rock pile with these men. He makes a cairn. He makes an altar to mark the way that they had come to serve as a reminder of God's faithfulness, to serve as a visual example of the amazingness of the God they worship. And so seeing this rock pile and hearing the story, the people of Israel would know clearly that they had not crossed the Jordan River on their own, but only through the power of God. When they see this pile of rocks, they knew God did this. By his hand, we forded that river. By his power and his faithfulness, we have accomplished this. So the rocks speak to all of us. Let them remind us of the glorious things that God has done, is doing, and wants to do in us and through us and with us to transform lives, our world, and eternities. Let all who see these rocks that we have know that we are praying for, that we are stepping out in faith and being obedient as we follow God. From start to finish, let our work have the fingerprints of God all over it. What else do these stones mean? Well, these stones that you are going to take home with you today, hopefully, these stones mean we have a missionary purpose. Joshua told Israel that the stones would serve as a reminder that all of the people of the earth might come to know that the Lord's hand is mighty and that they would always fear the Lord their God. Let no one be confused. We have no mission here except for the Great Commission. Jesus said this in Matthew 28 very clearly. Matthew 28, 16 through 20, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go. Imperative go. Go. Each and every one of you go. Everyone go. If you follow Jesus, go. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you until the very end of the age. And in the great commandment, then Jesus said, we need to be obedient. Where is God speaking to your heart today? What else do these stones mean? The stones mean that we must change if we want to go with God. The stones out of the Jordan marked the movement of God among his people. They testified to the willingness of a people to leave what they had known in order to go into an unknown future, but to go there with God. To go there and face the challenges in faith. To step out into the water and believe in what they could not see. Hear me on this. Between the realization of this dream and the burden that God has planted in each and every one of our hearts where we sit right now, there are undoubtedly some boundaries in our lives. Things that make us being obedient to what God has called us to do seem impossible. We cannot see yet how God's going to work. 
But we know God has called us to these things. If we believe that he is faithful, and I tell you, I know that he is, it's time for us to venture forward with God into the future he intends for us. Before you leave today, this is where the markers come in, I challenge you to take that marker and on that rock, write a single word. Write a word on that rock that will remind you very specifically of what God is calling you to do, of where God is calling you to be obedient, of the thing that God wants to do in your life, but you've been the barrier to seeing it happen. Where do you need to step out in faith? Where do you need to trust God more? Where do you want to see God work in your life? But you're the one who's holding back. But you're the one who's afraid to trust. But you're the one who says, no, that's impossible. Write that down. Put that on that rock so that rock might serve as a reminder of the God we serve. The God who moves mountains. The God who moves seas and rivers when we are obedient. Write a word on your rock before you leave today. If you haven't thought of it, think about it for a moment. And let God bring a word to your mind, a place, a thing, an item, somewhere you need to be obedient. This is all about God's glory. It's all about his missionary purpose for which we exist. It's a challenge to us to change so that God can manifest his glory more fully through us. We have to be strong and courageous. We have to, as we learned last week, take those first steps into the Jordan River and get our ankles wet in faith. We don't always know where God is going and what God is doing, but we know we are going to go with that God. And if you go where he leads, amazing happens. So as I said, write something on that rock and see if you are obedient what amazing things God will do. Let's pray.